I think we're live. Uh, I'm here with angry gay Pope. How you doing, Pope? Large is life and twice is natural. Happy <laughs> day, everybody. <laughs> you know, I, I would protest Scientologists wearing this mask and, and at big events, and, they, and this woman, a bunch of them, but this one woman, she goes, you wouldn't be so tough if you took that mask off. And I go, they've sued me five times. <laughs> 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 and if you Did look you... at it, I kind of look like a guy fox mask anyway. <laughs> Do Scientologists even know who Guy Fox is? They know what the mask means. Um, but but what do they think it means? They it means that there's protesters outside and they're hiding their identity. Um, but like as Karen Della Carrier said, that, well, I guess I could they know who I am, but I could put a mask on and be anonymous, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, some members of OSA have put on masks and infiltrated the group, like back in 2008. So it works all ways, works every which way. Anybody can do it, including your own enemies. Oh, if I was OSA, I would be doing that all day long. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's almost actually, now that you mention it, that's almost, um, I hadn't even thought about that, a, a, a big weakness of that strategy is anyone can just throw that mask on and infiltrate the group and cause trouble and set people up and all sorts of stuff. So that agent, had to be going on, agent right? Your agent provocateurs. Yeah. Someone who, uh, someone who, um, is sent there by OSA just to screw with people. And, um, they even had signs that said, you know, Joe blow no longer anonymous. And they had big signs with his face on it with his real picture. And his father was, a. Uh, uh, a lobbyist in Washington, D.C., and they got the guy to stop protesting by pressuring his father and say, your son is a terrorist. Wow. You know, working in this industry, you're going to make him stop protesting. It's horrible. Wow. I so up. tell me, how did you come to use the moniker Angry Gay Pope? Well, um, they told us uh, very specifically, like the first the first um, anonymous thing was in February 2008, and I, I didn't go to that because I was scared <laughs> I was afraid I'd be the only one there. Uh, and then when I saw in the paper that a lot of people had done it, I went to the second one and they said, uh, you got to hide your face, put a hat on so they don't know what your hair looks like, wear baggy clothing, like a baggy sweater. So they don't know whether you're fat or thin or pregnant or not, or they don't know what you look like under there. And so I went to the costume store and I thought, what can I put on my head? And I had three choices. I had a black afro. Well, that would be kind of racist. And then I had a pirate hat. Didn't have anything to do with pirates. And it reminds me of software piracy. I don't want to, you know, look negative. And then there was a Pope hat. And I thought, you know, born in a Catholic orphanage, Pope hat. It's religious. Shaped like a fish head. I'll go for it. And um, I was there with a Pope hat on and they were, I was angry. I was so angry. <laughs> I'm still angry. Um, but they all called me angry gay Pope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so angry, it, I'm gay, you know. So it really did come about organically like that. I didn't. I didn't think. Uh, I thought it was just going to be something you made up. So you were there with a Guy Fox mask and a Pope hat. No, I didn't do the Guy Fox mask at first because I said to myself, "Everyone's going to do that. That's just so cliche." <laughs> so I had a Mardi Gras mask on. It was gold. And but then I flipped back and forth. And and if you see me in the Day, the, the blue pimp pants with a rainbow shirt, the hat, and the mask. That's when Osa knows I'm on the warpath today, mm -hmm. and I'm going to risk arrest because I look so stupid. The cops will be embarrassed to be associated with me. <laughs> it's street theater, and they don't want to show up anyway. Uh, hmm. That's when they showed up a little more because Scientology had worn out its welcome with them so much at the Wilcox station. But you know, police don't want to show up because they know they'll be on camera, or it's just stupid, or the cult is weird, and they keep doing this, and the case isn't going to go anywhere anyway. And then I'm going to hassle them. So um, I haven't worn that one too much, but when I do want to get arrested, I dress like a normal person. <laughs> well, I've never met a normal person, but you know what I. <laughs> <laughs> um so you know i have this is really weird i have false memories associated with anonymous and it's one of the reasons it's one of well, many reasons well, i wanted to well, talk well, to you and were you in 2008 when it started well exactly this is this is well to answer your question i was already out of the sea org and living here in clearwater uh, living in scientology world just as a a pub you know technically speaking a public scientologist i wasn't really um, you know, doing anything, but here's what I mean by false memories. People ask me all the time. Um, 
what was it like dealing with anonymous when you were there? And my knee jerk answer has always been, yeah, they didn't really have an effect. It, it didn't have any, you know, we didn't notice. Mm -hmm. And because my false memories associated with anonymous is me being on staff at the Philadelphia org sometime between 96 and 2002. Oh no, no. <laughs> I know. Right. And then when I started looking up, um, just, the just book, recently, I know the book V for Vendetta had been written by them. <laughs> exactly. And so I was like, I was like 2008. What the, f I was like, then what the hell am I thinking? I'm like, I wasn't even in the orgs when anonymous was doing his thing. Why do I keep mm -hmm. saying it didn't have any effect? Like maybe it was just other protesters. I mean, uh -huh. and I felt a little silly and I was like, what the, I was like, Maybe I'm getting it confused with maybe I would go by the FH and see a bunch of people outside the FH and I'm just getting it mixed up with Philadelphia Harrison, or something. Fort Harrison, right? Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I, I just the, I don't know the Clearwater jargon. I know that's the, the SoCal jargon for these places. Have you yeah. never protested here in Clearwater? Well, Nancy Nathaniel told me it's a terrible place to protest because it, it's all locked up and the, the superpower building is huge. And, and the minute you get there, they all run inside or shunt themselves to another area. That's um, true. But I meant even back in the day, like, have you never, you've never done a Scientology um, event or a uh, protest in Clearwater? Uh, I'm self-employed. I haven't had a vacation in 20 years. So I'm not criticizing. I'm just I asking. We can not even afford to do that. And if I put my credit card in the little thing and bought a ticket somewhere at the HGB, uh, alarm would go off and they have a plan just for me, yeah. <laughs> just for me. They have a room here full of videos of me. They have already planned what they're going to do, and I do not want to go there to get bullshit arrested so that I will have to, like, fly there again to show up in court or something. I mean, maybe now we could do it with, you know, TV. Totally. But no, I get it. I get it. And so, anyway, it just occurred to me that, you know, for the last seven years, whenever someone asks me about Anonymous, I've get, been giving this particular answer, and, and I was good. like, and I was like, it's been, I've been totally full of shit the whole time. I was, wasn't even in the orgs by the time Anonymous started coming around. So anyway, well, and then well, it occurred. Karen Della Carriere, I did a video with her and Mark Bunker where she said that um, uh, she was at Big Blue as a public when Anonymous would be out there. And they would be told to just, you know, everybody get in a row. We're going to go, go march down out of here. And that's how she knew Anonymous was outside. Mm. So did you start um, participating in the anonymous protests pretty much right from the beginning? Yes, there was rumblings of it before February. Um, so at the a Tom Cruise video came out where he acts stupid and they took it down and people got mad. And because anonymous is anarchical, they love to make they love to laugh at other people's misfortune and stupidity. <laughs> and um, so they started doing things like uh, uh, you take a piece of black um paper you know construction paper like children use at school and you tape them all into a loop and then you put that into a fax machine and you fax them in the middle of the night and then it just constantly loses all of its fax ink and then they come in in the morning and there's like no ink and paper all over the floor you know so things like that but i mean there were also not so good things there was a guy who walked into a, a the new york ideal org like nude covered with um vaseline and toenail clippings and pubic hair so like i don't recommend that and i don't recommend hacking their websites why are you gonna people went to prison for that and why hack a website nobody's visiting you know it's true how so then at, how can you laugh at it if it's down <laughs> so then t tell me um it's kind of a two-part question and just uh, you know start it wherever you'd like either how you started, got involved or, or any interest in the subject of Scientology yeah. itself and then how it's, you got involved I, with the anonymous yeah, stuff. It's, it started with a uh, Time Magazine story, the, the Cult of Greed and Power. And I read that and I was like really impressed. But there's no Scientology in Cincinnati where I'm from. And, um, and then 60 Minutes, Mike Wallace did a really good story and the, the Cult Awareness Network, they had Kendrick Moxon on with the uh, uh, another CBS uh, correspondent. And um, so I just knew about Scientology and it was evil, but I'd never seen it. And like, I worked real, I worked my ass off to get out of Cincinnati and make it to Hollywood and start working in movies. And I did that successfully. Um, and when I got to Hollywood Boulevard, I was shocked that my new adopted main street hometown was full of Scientology. Mm -hmm. And like, I was afraid to go in. I was just afraid. And then one day I was walking past this place called Help, 
the Hollywood Education and Literacy Project. And I thought, oh, isn't that nice of these people helping poor Latinos to learn to read? And I go in there and there's this book, How to Read the Dictionary by L. Ron Hubbard. And, and I, I was talking to the girl saying, oh, that's so nice of you doing this in the neighborhood. And then I, I saw that, I'm like, what's your relationship with Scientology? And she says, well, LRH did write many of our books. And I was shocked that she used this phrase called LRH. I'm like, oh my God, they talk about him so much they don't even use his name. <laughs> and then I was ready to wet myself and I left. <laughs> and that was just help. That was just help. Well, what so, so you were scared. What was it that scared you? Um, I, we were, I was just paranoid because they had such a frightening reputation. And um, mm. I was afraid they'd follow me out. I was afraid if I protested them on my own, I'd be stepped on like a cockroach. Mm -hmm. uh, so when the anonymous thing started rolling in um, and then it got to January and people said, let's have a meeting in February all over the world, all over the world. Um, and I didn't go to that one, as I said, because I was afraid, but I went to the second one. Uh, yeah, the second one in March. And this was like, like no other protest. I mean, I would get up in the morning and I would log into YouTube and I would see people in Australia protesting. And as the world turned, the day would go by and videos would come up from, in, you know, eventually England and everything. And then last of all was us in, in SoCal because of the nature of time zones. And um, uh, it's totally unlike any other protest. I mean, you know, Americans fight with each other. and I, I hate Trump, but, you know, it's an internal to our country thing. But Scientology is a James Bond villain. It is global. You see a James Bond movie, they're flying all over the world, you know. And <laughs> can't just be an American protester or I love Hillary and I hate Trump and I'm going to vote. It's like, it's not like that at all. You have to go after them on a global basis. And nobody had done that before until we Anons did and other kind of protests. It, it, there's just never been anything like it. I mean, yes, now anonymous is screwing with um, the Russians and stuff like that, but this was sort of different. I mean, that's, that's one country again. Scientology right. is multi-country. And um, it was just an amazing experience. It was really fun. People made, made a lot of friends. So how did you go from being very afraid of them, um, not showing your face, to being their, their primary antagonist, uh, showing your face? <laughs> um, well, I guess uh, at first uh, we didn't. But then after about three months, they um, were following me. And um, they caught me going into a friend's house to fix his computer. Um, well, actually what happened is they followed me um, from the uh, protest. And I was told when I went to the protest by a, um, another fellow and on, she says, they're looking for you today. They really don't like you. Cause I would bang on windows and everything, you know? Um, so they were really focusing, but, but not just on me, but on everybody, but especially me that day. And so I was warned. And so I tried to go home without being followed, but they followed me with at least three cars. And you don't know that you're being followed when there's three cars, because you could be on an empty street for five minutes and they're actually just driving around in a circle and watching it. Um, and uh, they, they saw me go into this house and then this uh, uh, writer named Frank Sanello and I went to Best Buy to get him some computer stuff. And um, I was the one driving and I like, I like fender bended a little bit of car in front of me when I parked. And then we get out of Best Buy. There's these two old guys. One of them looks like he has a bandaid on his head and they had a big camera and they're like, uh, they're saying, you made an illegal turn out there. And then you destroyed that man's bumper. <laughs> and Frank is like, what is this all about? And I'm like panicking. I'm panicking because <laughs> it really, when you've never been spied on before or followed, it messes with your head. That's why they do it. And I'm like, you know, you go home and it's like, oh, the toilet's clogged again. Could it be the Scientologist and their weather machine? <laughs> <laughs> and you start tinfoil hatting because that's why, that's why they do it. You know, it's just human nature. And so I is this a thing like you did uh, have a little fender bender and they turned it into something bigger? Is that what you're saying? threaten me over it yeah yeah they tried to threaten me over it and mm. um then they knew they thought that i lived in that house that they saw me in so the next day i go over to that house again and i'm walking up the street on genesee and i have this on video um and there's this bald guy sitting in his car kind of um you know i'm 
the scoop ears are up now because I'm being followed, you know. It, I, it's better to be too paranoid than not paranoid enough. And he's sitting there. And then when I walked by, he was playing his music and stuff. And then when I walked by, all of a sudden, the music stopped. And they just sort of turned around. And I took out my camera. And I walked up to his door. And I stuck it in. And you can, you can see this on, on video. And, and I say, hi, what you doing? And he goes, oh, I'm fixing my radio. Well, shouldn't he have said, why are you filming me? <laughs> it's like every, it's like everybody knows what's going on, but we don't really say it, you know? And um, uh, I threatened him or something like that, and then I walked away. But then they, they found out where I lived. But when I put the video of him on the internet, they left me alone. Ooh, I Interesting. Cut, I cut myself shaving. Okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, so you started showing your face because they basically followed you and... I knew who I was, but it's not about yeah. showing my face or not. It's about what intimidates them. Like Tori Magoo said, um, even if uh, they know what you're... They know what you look like, wear a mask anyway, because mm. um, it interbulates them. And, um, you know, they do those um, training routines where you stare at someone's face, you know, Till you hallucinate, isn't that correct? Sure. <laughs> so she said having a mask like that messes with their heads. So, you know, when I'm going to sneak in there and do a, um, like go to the Inglewood Ideal Ward and wander around, I don't wear a mask, obviously, it would give it away. But when I want to intimidate them, I wear a mask. Yeah, no, it definitely makes it um, hard, if not impossible, to like actually deal with the person in front of you if they're wearing a mask i mean it's almost like well you know you know as soon as soon as you stick a camera in someone's face they don't know what to do like it's like uh, 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 uh. it's almost like an emotional reaction to object to what's happening here and um unless you're used to that you don't also realize how weird you look reacting that way i, I see the mask as something similar putting on a mask is like what do i do with this what like uh, it, it's an immediate uh you know curveball you don't know how to deal with that it, and a, a fun side effect is that um, it defeats spatial recognition software. So you can't load in a video from 2008, feed it into the computer and see what we look like. And some people would wear surgical masks and stuff. And so I, I, I had a video up, someone, someone made a comment. Um, why is everyone using flip phones? Because they saw people with masks on and they thought it was a COVID era, but they're all, we're all using 12 year old phones and the, the person watching couldn't understand it. So now the Scientologists are always wearing masks because of COVID and sometimes we're not, it's just ironic. It is just, mm. they're always in masks now. And so, the, RP, the RPFers have a black mask. You know, but I noticed some Scientology security guards wearing black masks as well. Yes, I've recorded one of them yesterday doing that. Yeah, mm. they have various stuff, and then their masks have little their little COVID logo on it. So it's does it really? Mm -hmm. They have a you know it's funny. So you know I live in Florida, so our, our restrictions are as lax as uh, anywhere. And I was in Costco the other day, and all of a sudden, uh, 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 the all, so many people with ma I'm seeing people with masks around me all all of a sudden. I'm like, what is going on? And then I hear someone speaking Russian. I'm like, ah, oh, it's the Sea Org members. And then I, a second later, I go, oh, look, it's Pat Harney. <laughs> so I took a picture of Pat Harney. I sent it to Mike Rinder. I'm like, look who's at Costco. <laughs> who's she? She's the main um, PR uh, person here in Clearwater who uh, will go out. I, if she were a lawyer, you could say she's Clearwater's Rick Moxon, but she's oh. not a lawyer. So she's just, um, I see. she's just a person. She's their PR person. You so know. she makes enough money to afford to go to Costco, or she was just lording over these people who were buying. No, it's it, it's weird. Well, we're getting close to the holiday season, right? And so the uh, the uh, what flag will do is they will stagger various shopping sessions oh. throughout the couple months leading up to the holiday season, so you can buy. You know, it, it's funny for for for, for the, you know the Sears members make no money, but they're also good at saving what little money they do make. <laughs> it's weird. Well, the funny thing about the masks is we were standing at the HGB building in the entryway, which now if I did it, they'd say I'm trespassing. But we were standing there and this OSA lady came out and was talking to us, which you can tell it was early in the protest because they would never do that now. Um, but uh, I'm talking to her. And it, first of all, she did the perfect thing of like, if I get one thing wrong, it's all wrong. And I said, the trade winds is full of blue asbestos. Do you have a comment? <laughs> And she says, trade wins. We don't have a book called The Trade Wins. We've never had a book called The Trade Wins. You don't know what you're talking about. Everything you say is wrong. And then um, 
Then the lady next to me with an anonymous mask on said something. And the Osabot lady says, I'm sorry, I can't understand you. Would you take your mask off? <laughs> and I said, don't you have operating fate and powers? Shouldn't you be reading your mind by now? But um, the, the, the masks cause them endless connections. And um, it's just could, could, could you imagine if those types of protests were going on today? I mean, Scientology has dwindled so much. They wouldn't have the resources to do. Uh, I mean, they would immediately max out all of their resources trying to dox all of these people. And 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 in this day and age, there's nothing more um, despicable than doxing someone. So as soon as they started doxing people, not just anonymous, but the entire Internet would start like like Scientology wouldn't even be able to deal with protests like that today. Thanks to COVID, they can't even deal with being Scientology. I mean, um, it's extremely difficult to protest now. All their buildings are empty. I was at the HTV for about 25 minutes last week, just checking them out. Sometimes I just go there and stare at them and nothing happens. And the guards would come out and handle me while I say absolutely nothing. <laughs> and I was there and I only saw one person in 25 minutes. And that was a, someone all in black. Uh, so I guess they're on the RPF. It's the only person I saw. And this is the HTV. I mean, for decades, people would be running in and out, going back and forth across the street, going down to the subway station to get to Big Blue or back again. Now there's like nothing. I haven't been to Big Blue in forever because they have a restraining order against me, um, uh, which expires next year. But I've been to like about the only place left to protest is the Welcome Center because um, it's the only place where they're open. And now they've, they've got an automatic door where they hit the emergency button on the underneath the desk and the door just goes. Mm. <laughs> I'm afraid wow. I'm afraid if I got my hand caught in it, it would just chop it off. And um, so that's kind of a scary thing. Like, what if they're locking the door on? We, uh, one of my um, fellow protesters, cameraman Sam, went in there on Guy Fawkes Day while I was causing a ruckus outside to get a, a, a personality test. And, um, you know, with those doors there, I was afraid he would get, like, locked in. Um, and when he found out there were 200 questions, he said to them, um, I'm here on Guy Fawkes Day just to infiltrate you. And when the great leader sees this video, you're all going to be in trouble. And then he ran for the door and he'd had his, get his camera in his pocket the entire time recording the sound. And he, cause they made him take his camera off because um, thanks to people like me, you're not allowed to take pictures in a Scientology place. You're not allowed. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, also frightening is um, the HGB uh, L. Ron Hubbard life exhibit. You go in the main doors and then, they go in the inner doors and they lock them. And the um, CCHR, the Psychiatric Museum of Death, you go in those doors and once you're in the museum, they lock that behind you. So um, it's scary. That's creepy. I mean, wow. I'm, bigger, I'm bigger than these security guards, but they have, they violate uh, California security guard laws because they have mace and handcuffs and a, a big bright flashlight they can use as a, you know, to conk you on the head with it. Um, uh, taser, they have tasers. Uh, so it's a good thing. They're all pathetically wimpy because it's, it's kind of scary. And wow. I know, hey, oh, um, have you seen, oh, well, you said you haven't been to big blue in a while, but I was wondering if Roy, big Roy was still around. Roy will always be there. He rescued someone, Roy Rodriguez. Um, I like to say that Roy, you you have a face that looks like a toilet, <laughs> not because he actually looks like a toilet, but his face looks like a turd. <laughs> I'm just free. So, I mean, I knew Roy, you know, I was good friends with his son, Sebastian, who's out of the Sea Org. Um, and Roy, you know, Roy was promoted to the rank of officer in the Sea Org for saving someone from a fire or something. Oh, yeah, he saved two people from a fire. And Happy Smurf told me he'll never be RP after anything like that because he was so heroic. So he's just going to be there forever, ever, ever, ever. I yeah. assume. But I mean, Sea Org members don't stay in the Sea Org for fear of being RPF'd. I mean, if anything, sending someone to the RPF might be an impetus for them to leave the Sea Org. Mm -hmm. But Roy, you know, it's funny, his first being such a big guy. His reputation was just being for such a, a soft spoken, like sweetheart, teddy bear of a man. Um, but and, and honestly, let me ask you this. Dealing with him as a security guard, what, wasn't he always the nicest one or was he not? Roy? Yeah. He speaks the least. Um, it's not that yeah. they're nice, but the ironic thing is um, I, I was showing one person my videos and he burst out laughing like, you know, the security guard's name. And I'm like, I know all the security guards names and their families and stuff because they're the only ones. You talk to it's either Karen Powell <laughs> to a journalist where she hangs up on them, or it's Roy. <laughs> That's they're the spokespeople now. And That's um, true. like, uh, nice. No, I wouldn't call them nice. I mean, they they have me arrested um, 
on false charges multiple times. Yeah. Well, no, I don't mean, I don't mean like necessarily nice to you, but as far as like, um, civil or polite or as far as, and, and, and look, I mean, I don't have much experience dealing with Scientology security guards from that side of the equation, but what, I, I guess what I'm imagining is that perhaps there were some who were specifically trying to evoke a reaction out of you as opposed to perhaps others who were just there. And I don't know, Roy just, I've seen Roy pop up in some, some videos and it seems to me like he was just kind of there. He's just there. <laughs> um, uh, more in charge there would be a kind of Odo Huber, but especially Jason True, who wouldn't even come out after, a, a, anymore when I'm there. He just, he will not deal with me. <laughs> That's thing. But I could hear I could hear him, his voice crackling on the radio, like Pope's here. And like, they all call me Pope because that's what everyone called me before they knew my name. And yeah. if they want to call me DM, hey, fine. I'm the angry gay Pope of Anonymous, Don Myers, DM. Oh, that's right. Your initials are DM. And just like the angry gay Pope of, um, just like the angry gay Pope of uh, uh, Scientology. So my, that means Mark Headley has your initials tattooed on his shoulder. I guess you could say that. I mean, if, if he if he only just used the initials, then um, he would. Do you know what I'm well, talking about? So, so uh, Mark got DM initialed on his shoulder for Depeche Mode. Depeche Mode. He's the biggest oh, Depeche Mode fan in the world. And I then thought, Miscavige. I they made him get that. <laughs> Miscavige came up to him on the base one time. And was like, "So why do you have my tattoos initialed on your shoulder? That's uh, that's a little weird." Uh -huh. <laughs> and then of course now you've got Danny Masterson with the initials, and then and then Donald Meyer. So there you go. Um, let me go back to Anonymous. How would you describe the actual goal of Anonymous at that time? And do you think uh, well, it was achieved? The goal, the goal has always been the same: the dismantling of the Church of Scientology in its present form. It's mm -hmm. legalese, but it is. The dismantling of the Church of Scientology in its present form. You could you could go to you know have uh, auditing and stuff like that. It just can't be spying on people and charging them too much and all that sort of thing. And that's the official. That's the official thing. In reality, um, you know what we really want. We want them gone. So then why did they stop or did, I mean, there must've been a point where things just started to fizzle out or maybe it was like, this is getting kind of boring. Like uh, if they um, didn't go ahead. About two and a half years into it. And I mean, at the beginning I was like, do you really think we can do this once a month? Because I don't know people will have the impetus or whatever, but they did have an impetus once a month. Um, and then eventually began to peter out. And then I was the only one protesting when the Simon Wiesenthal Center gave Tom Cruise an award for him mm. giving so much money, which disgusted me. And Spielberg wouldn't even show up for it. Um, but what was going on was, um, yeah, there was some burnout and stuff like that. But first of all, people were fair gamed terribly. People, Andre, he got kicked out of his, he got evicted from his home and he's from Sweden he was just visiting. Uh, other people have had parties interrupted. People came to their to their house or place of business saying they're terrorists with fake legal documents, and um, and then the the OSA bots would um, stir up the anonymous sleazeballs. Who this was the very beginning of um, people becoming able to be jerks on the internet um, without meeting you in person, and they criticize you constantly on the internet. Then you see them in person and they're terrified of you or they run away, and um, like. Mona Mia, um, we just did a modest protest one time at the Celebrity Center, and she got nasty text messages in the message boards. Um, I hope you die in a fire. And she said, I was in a fire as a child was almost burned. And like it brought back flashbacks and she quit protesting immediately because like mm -hmm. it's bad enough with Mox and F you. But when the, your own team are jerks, it's like and of course, Scientology encouraged all that. And, and uh, they tried to destroy the Why We Protest um, website. And now it's just a, I was thrown off and Karen Della Carriere, they say horrible things about her just to, to try and make people stop going to that website anymore. It didn't do anything yeah. but make it more difficult. Scientology still went downhill. But then the outside world kicked in. And in 2008, we were just starting to protest. And that was exactly when the economy collapsed because of the um, real estate bubble. So, you know, people didn't have the money to take a day off or to drive here from San Diego, uh, paying for the gas and all that stuff. It just, um, you know, the middle class took a real hit there. And uh, that was another thing that did it. So by like early 2010, um, the people who said I was doing it all wrong weren't doing it at all. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. So, but anonymous, 
I mean, I've been fixing my lawyer's computer for 12 years now. So, you know, you make a lot of friends and, and uh, those friendships are still there. So I, I've been fixing Granberry's computer for like over a decade and, um, and uh, do it for free if I have to. So we, we made a lot of um, progress. And then that gave the old guard of uh, the, the, the protesters like Tory Magoo that were exhausted. It gave them new energy and eventually led to things like um, the Leah Remini show because mm. uh, uh, they're, they're so weakened that um, um, they just couldn't go after their exes like they used to. It's true. Very true. You know, I kind of, uh, so my, um, I guess what I do, what I've been doing on this channel, I guess for about seven what, years. What I, what, I, what I like that you do is um, you ran for office or you broke that story with the horrible bunks the other day. You're actually doing something. People like Chris Shelton just sit there talking and it's like, you're not going to accomplish much. Mm. Well, I, I shouldn't. Um, I mean, Chris is a, a you know, a friend uh, of mine. So uh, <laughs> that's all I would say. That's all I would say. <laughs> um, but I guess what I was going to say there is that um, I guess my like it's never occurred to me to go and protest outside of an org, for example. And that's what I'm about to explain is that for me, when I was in Scientology, uh, I guess it wasn't anonymous who was ever protesting outside the orgs, but every now and then there'd be something. I, I remember and I, like the mad picket with Mark Bunker where they, they stuck gum on his lens. Yeah. No, I've seen all sorts of that kind of footage, but remember yeah. I would have been like in Philly uh, where uh, kind of an, kind of an output, not LA, not Clearwater. Um, for me, when I was on the inside, I don't remember any external activity, particularly having any impact on me. Mm -hmm. However, there was a two year period from 1998 to 2000 when I had left staff and I was living in Hollywood and just living a life, not really having anything to do with Scientology for two years. Huh. There was an internet cafe on the corner of Hollywood and Vine called Cyber Java. And I worked there. Oh, uh -huh. and that was my introduction to the internet. And during that period of time, I still considered myself a Scientologist during this time. I just didn't have anything to do with Scientology. Mm hmm. I stumbled into some of the websites, whether it was um, uh, Operation Clambake or whatever it was. I don't I, I remember the Clambake thing because I was like, I didn't get the joke. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. The stuff that I saw to me was so off putting that How it enabled. Well, the way things were being discussed and described was so insulting or insulting derogatory ex uh, i'll say exaggerated but that's subjective how do i know if it was exaggerated but i'm just telling you what was going through my head right. so derogatory it was such a, a turnoff that it allowed my scientology programming to immediately kick in and go oh yeah it's just a bunch of sps spreading a bunch of lies now look in retrospect a lot of the stuff that i thought was hyperbole and exaggeration was actually true it was just so beyond what i could conceive that i it right but how it was being discussed was so off-putting to me. It allowed the Scientology oh, programming to kick in. Me. They're, they're treating you like you're a moron or any Scientologist must be stupid or brainwashed. or Exactly. Smart. Yes. That's, or that, even that's more of that anarchical stuff that anonymous was doing because they, they kicked in because they wanted to make fun of Tom Cruise and the video got taken down. Right. So it's, it's been a problem. Uh, but uh, the main thing people seem to have with me is that um, they think I'm trying to save somebody. Mm. I mean, for for the vast amount of time, there was nothing you could do for them. Dial one eight six six XC org or something. It, it didn't work. There, it had hung up on that. That didn't work for a long time until mm -hmm. the Aftermath Foundation, um, uh, which I scream and yell about, and they 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 all look like they're ignoring me when they're listening to every word. Um, uh, until the Aftermath Foundation, my I have only two goals. I want this Scientologist to get into trouble so that they will be abused and they will either blow or die, which is a mean thing to say, because I know like, you know, um, folks have their children in there and uh, yeah, I want your children to die. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, I've, I've criticized um, you and not directly. And honestly, it's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you face to face because so much gets lost when you're typing words on the internets. <laughs> like when I saw, I saw the video of you, this is, I'm going to switch gears. This is not a criticism at one of the Scientology, at one of the Scientology events. And you had a sign and you, it, it was like a birthday event. I don't remember. It was, it was, 
I it had to be a couple of years ago because Scientology hasn't done an event in a couple of years. Yeah, and you was, were like, was, if you want to blow the aftermath. Wait, what? Was it the LRH birthday party? Yeah, yeah. Sounds right. Yeah, yeah. You were like, if you want to blow the aftermath foundation can help. And you were screaming at these guys. And, and I was like, God damn, I love that. I was like, you know Ooh. what? I was like, there's no one else who's going to go right into the faces of a thousand Sea Org members and Scientologists with an Aftermath Foundation sign and just, you floor. can blow and the Aftermath Foundation can help. Now, I'm mentioning that because I remember when I saw that, I was like, this was before I was posting videos as easily and frequently as, as I am now. And I was like, you know, I just want to put up a video that says, you know, I don't usually like how angry gay pope does what he does because be, because and because, yet because, he's got, because. And, and yet he's got giant balls of steel to go and do something that is productive no matter how you do it letting these people know that the aftermath foundation exists and that if they want to blow there is help it, my, the internet has the internet has commented on the size of my testicles since 2008. It's like, you have balls of steel. You have huge balls. <laughs> but um, yeah, the uh, the aftermath foundation signs are by far the most like. Don't, I do not. I never badmouth LRH except on his birthday. I never badmouth LRH. That's like it's like you know they have enough trouble dealing with the fact that Miscavige is a mess. <laughs> so like, let's not push it. They're kind of like. Uh, heroin addicts, and I just want them to be on a, a, like morphine instead, something not as bad. <laughs> and right. The, the Aftermath Foundation is much better than yakking about Xenu or this or that. I mean, like uh, the missing persons and the Aftermath Foundation is what gets them every time. Otherwise, if I'm talking about Xenu, it's like I'm criticizing my church, the Catholics, because Jesus's mother couldn't have been a virgin. Well, who cares? They're raping little children. What's more important, a virgin story or that kid got raped? You know, right. But I'll he's... tell you what. Have you ever, um, um, you know, we, um, the Aftermath Foundation sends out for free professionally printed cards that have little slogans on them, kind of right. like if you want to leave, the Aftermath Foundation can help. And if you keep doing things where you're going to different organizations or the test center or the welcome center or whatever, you could either like literally hand these guards the cards or just throw them in the door, and they would have to see them and pick them up and anything like that they have to see them yeah we did something like that once i think and um uh sometimes we'll leave our xenu signs behind when the sign is getting old <laughs> yeah but don't steal them they will if i leave my sign alone a guard will grab it and crush it oh yeah that makes sense so what i was saying about like um the operation clam bake stuff is that one of the reasons well, one of the reasons I even started my channel, but particularly the reason I talk about Scientology issues the way that I do is a direct response to my own experience of, I could have left Scientology in 1998 if the resource I was looking at was credible and well, whole, believable system, to me. The whole system is designed to prevent you from doing that. It reminds me of a, one of those carnivorous plants where when the, the deeper into the plant, the ant crawls, the more the backward pointing hairs keep it from getting out until eventually it's just digested. <laughs> um, yeah, with, a, uh, with a, I can see why you wouldn't want to do what I do because you've got like lots of emotional baggage from being in those organizations or being protested or something like that. But it may take, you, you don't ever have to do it, but you've already been, you know, doing protests and stuff. But um, how about if you came here and you, you wandered into the Inglewood Ideal Org and acted to go, I'm like, ooh, what's going on? What's this? <laughs> no, but here's what I mean. Like, Scientologists who do stumble on the internet, and we know that they do. Well, first of all, like, we get like a David the Miscavige, actor, Like David Miscavige's father when he gave him an unlocked uh, tablet. Right. If they stumble onto the internet and and instead of seeing something that is incredibly derogatory and insulting to them uh it talks about the subject in a way that they go oh shit not only does this person know what they're talking about he's actually being really really fair then well, it, it doesn't allow their programming to kick in right exactly but once again i don't care if their programming kicks in i want them rpf but if you want kind of that kind of stuff i did 83 videos with karen della carrier sitting down talking about everything i mean i would go home and cry because of editing a video called prisoner of a scientology medical waste incinerator and you know it's it's just Eventually, I had to stop simply because it just got too debilitating for me. But yeah. if you want any of those kind of sitting down talking head videos, 
Karen Dela Carriere has 83 of mine, just mine alone and plenty others she's done with others. So um, saying that, well, he's a jerk or it's the, it's the same thing like Chris Shelton has done it where just like the lady with the trade wins, free wins. If I do one thing wrong, it's all wrong. <laughs> and that, that video you saw of me shouting until I almost threw up uh, about the Aftermath Foundation, it won't matter. Mike Rinder and Chris Shelton, they just don't care. They just don't care. Don't care about what? Anything I do. They think it's Oh, 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 oh. It's, uh, counter, it's counterproductive because you're not helping them leave. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, I hear what you're saying. I mean, look, you, I, I could say the same thing. I mean, honestly, I, I, and it is something I've said when, when I've been asked about you, I have said in some of my videos, yeah, I don't like how he does what he does, but I'm glad he does something because at least it's something. And yet, yeah, um, when I play bad cop, it, it distracts them from. So, so, but let me ask you about it. Cause uh, from what you just said, if I heard you correctly, um, you're saying that your goal, like what you're trying to do by showing up and doing what you do, you're saying is not the same as my goal. So what, what is, how would you describe your goal then? What, what is it? Well, promote uh, at the end of it, you promote the aftermath foundation, but you don't bad mouth LRH and you try and get Scientologists in trouble and push their buttons, get something interesting on camera. That's educational entertaining and interbulating. Hmm. How would it get them in trouble though? Uh, because the great leader sees the videos and um, uh, he loves to have excuses to, uh, oh. you know, like, oh. um, like uh, anti shirtless lady, Lisa Uvizel. Um, she was at the HGB and um, uh, she ended up getting a restraining order against me. Um, and the first time we went in, it was a, it was a bogus thing. You know, all I did was talk to her on the street. And the judge gave her the restraining order uh, just because they were throwing mud at the wall with me legally. And um, <clears throat> she uh, showed up in court looking horrible. I mean, she looked like ugh, dark circles under her eyes, lost weight. She wasn't the perky girl you saw in the video. And I thought, wow, I have the power to dick these people over. <laughs> so it's basically DM versus TM, you know, and um they get into trouble like that. And uh, the, the handler... So you're saying if they if they don't handle it correctly, you're, you're trying to throw enough at them that they mishandle you in a way that gets them in trouble. Correct. And I'll also do things like I'm doing now. I, I put up one video from the Guy Fox Day thing the other day, but I'm not going to put up the other videos until um, after 2 p.m. next Thursday. Why is that important? Um, until after 2 p.m. Why would you wait until after? I thought you'd want to do it before. No, after 2 p.m. They have put in their stats for the week and they have written all about, you know, whatever they experienced with me. And if that doesn't coincide with what I put up, they're going. Oh, to I see what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm um, okay. forcing them, I'm, I'm forcing them to, um, uh, get another attempt at getting hurt because maybe they didn't add a detail that was important that I did say that day or something like that. And Ms. Cabbage um, watches my videos and um, he, uh, he loves to have excuses to uh, hurt people. So I just mm. give. I so excuse. I have to imagine, um, well, you did describe, you said they got a restraining order on you. How, how else has Scientology, how else have you tangled with Scientology legally? Um, there have been seven, not lawsuits, but lawsuit clusters, I guess you'd call it. And my lawyer, one time my lawyer put a couple of them into like a, a, a cult class action. Or, <laughs> I mean, they will throw all sorts of um, silly uh, charges at me just for talking loud or whatever, or the most minor of civil disobedience. You know, I'm never going to hit anyone or anything like that. But they had me for... Um, there was one TRO for talking to a guard that got thrown out. Then there was the TRO with the anti-shirtless lady that stood for three years. And then there was um, the Delphi Academy. Well, actually on Guy Fox Day, one time I was arrested just for talking to her because the restraining order had expired. But once they, once they arrested me for just talking to someone, I just lost. It's like the movie V for Vendetta when she loses all of her fear of dying. And mm -hmm. that's when you uh, really upset people. So I'm not afraid anymore. So, they just made it worse for themselves by um, arresting me without cause. Now, I'll give you have, a cause. <laughs> have they successfully had you prosecuted for anything? Oh, lots of things. Well, mm. I mean, training orders. 
I, um, I don't know legally if uh, what uh, where uh, where a, a restraining order fits into misdemeanor uh, prosecution. Like, I, is that considered a prosecution? I didn't think so. Um, I'm not sure. You'd have to ask my lawyer, Graham Barry. Who? I, I mean, other than them getting restraining orders on you, though, have they had you arrested and convicted of something? Uh, I think I've been convicted. Yes, talking to you. Later. But what, what happens is, um, I'll either threaten to go to court or I'll drag it out. And uh, most of the charges are bogus anyway. Um, one time we were having a debate over what the restraining order was for technical reasons. And um, Graham and I went downtown to the misdemeanor center uh, where this cop was talking to us, this Asian lady. And she says, well, let me pull up your file. And she pulls up my entire legal history. And she's going, oh, boy, page down, page down, page down, page down, <laughs> page down. She was, you've got a lot. And I said, um... A lot of those charges were thrown out. Is that like everything or is that just, oh no, this is everything, sir. <laughs> so yeah, they've, um, but the thing is, I like the restraining orders because it forces, like um, anti-shirtless lady um, and uh, Catherine Frazier and Ken Long were all at the opening of the uh, Scientology Media Center, their Sunset Boulevard um, studio. And they were all right there at the VIP entrance because they they planned ahead knowing I'd go for that and um, from across the street. And so they had all the people who had had restraining orders against me before lined up right in front of me. It's like you can't miss it. <laughs> so so that, so that doesn't help you, though, right? You said you love them. Restraining, the restraining orders allow me to control them and make them show up for stuff. So then I can say they're getting in my way on purpose uh, to prevent me from protesting. Mm, so without I a see. restraining, when, when I had a restraining order against me from Ken Long, when I went to the Christmas parade, all the cops came out and were uncomfortable said, Fred, you're, you're going to have to leave, you know, 10 cops looking at me. If I don't have a restraining order against me, when I go to that Christmas parade, um, the cops just ignore me. So it's strangely, it gives me an odd sort of power. Interesting. Interesting. Um, well, what else? I mean, so anonymous is still a thing. I mean, they still exist, but they don't really do anything about Scientology anymore. You think they just got bored? Well, anonymous is a, anonymous is as anonymous does. Anonymous is as anonymous was. Um, it's different people. It's uh, it's they they don't have a. They, people would say to me, "You are giving anonymous a bad reputation." I'm like it's impossible for anonymous to have a reputation because it's just individual persons. And um, the, the New York times did a story with Guy Fox masks all over the world in places that were like Syria and Africa and China, people protesting with Guy Fox masks on in part to hide their faces uh, from facial recognition. So it continues to happen. Um, uh, like look at the, they're, they're attacking Russia now. Um, doxing them, uh, taking over their websites. Um, and the U.S. government just loves it, I'm sure. <laughs> You're not going to tell Anonymous what to do. So people in Anonymous were saying that you were giving Anonymous a bad reputation for being so confrontational? Yes. Hmm. But when they went confrontational, I mean, there was, a, there was a murder at the Celebrity Center where this guy came in with a sword. And he, we called him Epic Sword Guy. He came in with a sword and they shot him right away. Well, Mona Mia and I went out there that night and just interviewed the, um, the local news crews. I screamed and yelled and Moxon came out and um, we, we talked to the guards and then I covered the story, you know, and uh, then we went home. The next day, you would think we had shot the president. Like, don't you have any respect for that man dying? And like, well, weren't the press there already? I mean, it's just they, these people um, love to get upset. Without and people don't like uh, uh, altruistic colleagues like the teacher's pet. They don't like that. And if people people join anonymous because they want to be the hero, and all they do is stand there. I mean, sometimes they wouldn't even bring signs at the end of it. They just stand there and watch me run back and forth. Um, and um, people want, might want to be the hero of anonymous, but when some other people like Anon Orange and I um, do something, they didn't. They get very jealous and angry, and it. And it threatens their um, sense of ego or importance. So they would call us like, oh, the Wonder Twins are ready to get because they went to Twin Peaks and risks to rest, you know? Well, then you do that, jerk. I actually think doing things like going 
to the CST bases in Twin Peaks. I think that's amazing. I think that's that's like I mean that's interesting for many reasons. The, Have you gone to one only one CST base or more than one? I've been to Twin Peaks and I've been to Gold Base, but I haven't mm. been to like Trementina in Arizona or those other things. The other ones are very hard to get to, and it, they've mm -hmm. been flown over with drones, and there's not much interesting there. I mean, it's great to see their property and their the entrances to their um, vaults, but there's like maybe one person there or something like that. And you'd have to walk onto their property for 15 minutes just to get to a building. So, uh, Twin Peaks is extremely vulnerable and um, you can park up the hill at the uh, Christian center, walk down there and um, you're on their property without them even knowing it. Mm. You know, and the other people, type of people have been RPF for us doing that. Also, uh, a non orange went back a week later when we had protested there and they were buying all of this um, plantings to try and cover up the um, fences with plants. And they're now covered with thorns and spikes. You, even if 60 minutes went there now, you wouldn't see what we saw because they grew all these plants. And that woman, I forget her name, but um, she came out and told a non orange to go away and she was wearing all black. So that tells me she had been RPF. Um, Jane McNair and some of the others. Uh, I was told that they will almost certainly be RPF'd for the first time that they went that we went there. Uh, um, one of the exes said that um, there's never been anything like this happen in CST ever, and it's going to pop their stupid little bubble of superiority. I got to tell you, if there was like you know, if anonymous was like more of an organized thing, and I could give them some advice. Oh boy, doing what anonymous <laughs> did, what what anonymous did back in 2008. If they did that again, but focused on CST bases, that would be a very big deal. Mm. Yeah. Um, one of the things is uh, like the lady, the lady who was my uh, psychiatrist in jail, she gave me the sanity test. Are you saying? Yeah. <laughs> um, she said, you know, you really should watch it. You're being too Jesus-y. Why are you getting yourself arrested to take down a religion that's dying anyway. And that was another thing that like, well, it's dying. Anyway. Oh, I don't want anyone to do anything that would get them arrested. I want them to do more like first amendment auditor type stuff of like, you know, more than anyone Scientology yeah. can't stand the fact that someone might stick a video camera in their face on oh, public exactly. property. Exactly. But, um, but, uh, one of the problems that anonymous died out is like, part of it was that, you know, um, it's, it's going to die anyway. And people say to me, why do you why do you videotape them so much? They're like gonna go extinct. And I said, that's like saying, why record mountain gorillas? They're gonna go extinct anyway. Well, isn't that more of a reason to do it? Because like I said, if 60 minutes went to Twin Peaks now, they would just see rose bushes and thorns. Yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. Um, well, very interesting. Um, what else? What else? So is there anyone else? So there's you. There's Nathaniel. Who else is still doing any sort of I, I, I'm characterizing it as First Amendment auditor type things. Just the idea of recording. I mean, Nathaniel does more of the First Amendment auditor type stuff. You wouldn't describe what you do as that, right? No. And in fact, at first, when he said, um, oh, I'm not a Scientologist. I'm an auditor. I went, what? <laughs> what are you? Because I'm very suspicious by nature because they've, you know, what, is someone going to set me up? Is this guy really a, 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 an agent of theirs? We said, oh, I'm an auditor. Like, oh, what? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, a non-orange doesn't do it anymore. A non-sparrow doesn't do it anymore. Smurf is dead. Um, uh, and sometimes I'll see videos online from people who just kind of wander around big blue, but it's very amateurish and kind of self-absorbed and goes on and on and on. It's not edited. I'll tell you, if I find anyone out there putting up content First Amendment auditor type content at CST bases. I will do everything in my power to blow those videos up and get them as uh, as uh, as big an audience as possible. Because I don't know, C CST is one of those things. It's like Scientology just doesn't want anyone to know about that. Yeah. And Shelly Miscavige, to the best of our knowledge, yeah. is at the CST base in Skycrest or wherever. It's got yeah. a few different names. Uh, There's no yeah. reason for people to stay away from that place. Um. The, the neighbors tell their the neighbors tell their children about gold base. People go in, but they don't go out. Stay away from that place. Kind of like, kind of like um, people in New Jersey made up the Jersey Devil. Don't go out in the swamps, kids. The Jersey Devil will get you. Well, in reality, there's snakes and quicksand and stuff. There's no Jersey Devil, but it's, it, it functions the same way. And in Twin Peaks, the rumor is that L. Ron Hubbard's frozen head is in a vault. They're like Walt Disney. <laughs> 
you know those rumors that Walt Disney's been frozen? <laughs> so I like, think he really what? was, though, wasn't he? I think he really was. Oh, uh, no. I'm a Disney anime. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Roy's the good one. Walt's the evil one. <laughs> so hey what are the chances what are the chances we can scare up some people to go do, go do some videos at cst bases there's like three or more of them we got to find some of these even there's got to be some new cst bases we don't even know about i don't know but twin peaks is the most beautiful and the most striking and when we went there the first place we saw was these little pink if you if you saw that there's a trailer i have called the shelly miss cabbage project that's sort of based on the blair witch project and it's all black and white when we're going there but there were these pink ribbons, rubber ribbons, stuck to the ultra barrier, like someone had come there um, missing her or something like that. It was very eerie. Hmm. But uh, Twin Peaks is just gorgeous. And you're up really high, and you can get right up to on the easement. The easement uh, is so close that you can just go up to the fences and stuff. And then they'll hmm. call the police, and then we'll, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll just, like, annoy the police. <laughs> That's yeah. It. See, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep harping on this point because – um, especially if one of the reasons why something like this doesn't get done is that people don't have the time and the money to do it. If someone had a YouTube channel, just look at some of these first amendment auditor YouTube channels. They get tons of views. Uh, Google AdSense would generate plenty of revenue to make this activity, uh, you know, pay for itself. If somebody, um, well, now, you know, now you're getting into a slippery slope where like they're irritating people, um, to get advertising revenue. So that's why I um, don't have as, a, like, as opposed to as opposed to what irritating them for no reason at all. <laughs> no, I mean like um, like suppose uh, suppose I was auditing you, and I mean I'm not a First Amendment auditor. I don't know how it works, but suppose I was auditing you, and I said you're a jerk just to upset you on the camera. Well, what if I slapped you, and then I'd get more ad revenue from views? But maybe they'd say to to YouTube, oh, he's violent. So. You well, yeah, I mean, the problem in that example is a crime was committed. You got to do it without committing a crime. <laughs> right. So, uh, like, honestly, some of my favorite YouTube channels I just binge watch is some of these First Amendment auditor channels. There's a guy who just straps a camera to his head and walks around city halls. And it's amazing uh, how people will just come out of everywhere to tell this. You can't film here. You can't film here. And he he very calmly. The guy's smart. Uh, he's calm uh, and he never goes alone. Right. So he always has someone filming him, even though he's got three cameras on his own person and his videos get hundreds of thousands of wow. views. If someone could do it the right way without um, I'm not even going to say without getting arrested because Scientology will try to get you arrested, wow. but do it the right way where no matter what trouble they get into, they can get out of it because the law is on their side and it's being recorded from six different angles. It would well, fund it, it, itself. It arrested me. I mean, it can take days to get out of the criminal justice system because it's broken, and you can barely even uh, call your lawyer. The system is so broken. And if I you're, understand. if there's a, if if Monday's a holiday and you and I got arrested on Friday afternoon, I have to sit through the entire weekend and Monday um, to get to see a judge, maybe on Tuesday. So um, just the fact that they arrest you, even though the charges won't stick. They're hoping you'll get beaten in prison or get a skin infection. Totally. Stuff like now, that. don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to twist your arm to do this. I'm saying anybody, right. anybody, yeah. anybody who's listening. Yes, yes. Look up the anyone who's listening. Look up these First Amendment auditor channels. Look how many views they get, and imagine how much interest a channel would get that was dedicated to doing that specifically yeah. at Scientology properties, right. specifically at the CST bases, specifically where Ooh. Shelley is. It could blow up. Yeah, but you can't do that every week. It would get boring. Um, that's I kind of don't really get the First Amendment auditor thing. Um, standing outside a library, pointing a camera at it or whatever. It's, I've it's I've become addicted to it, and I've started to understand it better. I used to. I prefer more conflicts. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but that's uh, but if but television, the, the... Loves, television loves conflict. But I'll tell you, the conflict um, uh, creates itself. I mean, in the case of the city hall, you have. Uh, these bureaucrats right. who just don't understand that they work for the public and they think all they the can order you. All, they only know how to say no. That kind of people. Right. Right. Yeah. And anyway, I'm just throwing it out there because I truly believe that if someone, well, first of all, it's got to be done by someone who wants to do it as a passion, but they don't have to sacrifice or be a martyr. This thing would pay well. Like, it's not like they have to be a martyr for it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, 
and and Google does you the favor of putting ads on your videos. You, you know, you don't have to you don't have to do Patreon. You don't have to do these programs. Yeah. I've had I've had ads on other channels that I've done, and I originally had ads I think on mine, um, but after my channel was taken down like three different times, I like I won't even go there. Just like mm. I, won't even go. I mean, they 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 DDoS attacked my uh, uh, the day that the Scientology Network premiered was L. Ron Hubbard's birthday, March thirteenth, two thousand eighteen. That was the exact minute that my website got DDoS attacked, and so they the internet um, has in computers that are infected with viruses that are controlled by ne'er-do-wells and they attack your website and all these computers try to go to it at once. I was getting like 8 billion hits a week, 8 billion. And wow. at, the, at the exact same time, they took down my um, YouTube channel over bogus crap because they had given so much money to YouTube to advertise their network, even though no one was going to watch it, that um, uh, like I, I had one called Big Breast Stress Test because like all you see are the woman's breasts because the camera's hanging around. Like, it's, there's no nudity or anything. But that this was they were really on the kick of um, uh, the Me Too movement and got to protect the rights of women. Kind of like how they're going after Paul Haggis with potential bullshit. Um, yeah. And so I had all these. I had three videos taken down because of quote anti-women or sexual things, obscenity, and it's just nonsense. It's it was, true. I mean, look, even. Even my videos, because I know um, what YouTube will try to censor and demonetize, mm -hmm. I very much color within the lines. Half my videos get demonetized, and then for and then I'll pro I'll I'll appeal it. Oh. Forty forty eight hours later, YouTube goes, "Oh, you're right. That was fine." I'm like, "Yeah, f you know, forty eight hours and a hundred thousand views later, thanks for nothing." Right. So don't get me wrong; it's always going to be a little bit of a minefield. But I'm just telling you, if someone would do this the right yeah. way, it would be a self-funding operation. Right. I, I, and I would do everything in my power to help those videos blow up. I am endlessly fascinated by the CST basis. And I was in Scientology. I imagine people who are not in them would are even more fascinated by them. They're fascinating. They show they show a little of it in in their Scientology Network promos or whatever. I know I did I did a little video about it, but I want to do more. And um, I and mean, come on, deal. that was a big deal for them, I'm sure, because they don't want to talk about it. It's a, it's a rather secret thing. CST it's true. CST uh, is responsible for caring for LRH tech. Yeah. Do you know what I learned recently that never occurred to me is that I always thought of CST, the project of CST, and the preservation of the tech as being like sort of a never ending. Prog, uh, process and I was speaking to um, uh, Dylan Gill about it and he sort of pointed out to me that you know it's done right mm -hmm. like it's not an ongoing process there's only so much tech to preserve yeah. and there's only so many vaults you don't have to make a hundred copies you right. make like five copies and you're done well, the and more I was money, like that didn't occur to me well the more money they spend on that I believe LRH left them 80 million um, when he died the more money they spend on that, they could just tell the IRS that we are, you know, um, spending this yeah. money on stuff that's tax deductible. Yeah. Well, it's also interesting that that Scientology, I think, continues to raise money for preservation of the tech, even though yeah. it's <laughs> done. Dunzos. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. We've been going for an hour now. Why don't we keep it at, at this so I can um, put little yeah. chapter breaks and have it be manageable. And um, let's think of some other fun things to discuss. Um, <laughs> with that ultra barrier, what's it like to be on the very edge of gold base looking at their ultra barrier? It's very frightening. Yeah. Turning yeah. Spikes. So wait, so what is, is your, is the name of your channel angry gay Pope or does it have a different name? The original was angry gay Pope, but that was three channels ago. Um, if you just go to YouTube and search angry gay Pope, it'll, it'll come up. Okay, cool. All right. Well, everyone check it out. And um, for I'm going to, I hope I get some, if you hear of anyone who wants to do this, uh, a CST first amendment auditor stuff, um, uh, put them in, put them in touch with me and I'll have you have a chat, chat with them about it, give them some advice or anything like that. Okay. I'll send you, I'll send you a link to the one where we, we went, we saw the pink ribbons. Yeah. Yeah. Really awesome. Thanks for watching everybody. Bye-bye. Talk, talk to you soon. Bye.